My mother uh, had dreams of being a writer, and I used to see her type in the front room. The front room was also where I would go when I was six, so I would sit there and watch her. And uh, this, uh, clearly she was making a heroic effort, and the things would go off in brown envelopes to New York or Philadelphia even, which had the post in those years, and they would come back. And so uh, the notion of it being something that was worth trying and could indeed be done with a little postage and, and effort uh, stuck in my head. But my real art interest, my real love was for visual art, and that was what I was better at. It was considered at first. My mother saw that I got drawing lessons, some reading lessons. I took what art the high school offered. I went to Harvard, still thinking of myself as some kind of potential cartoonist. And I got on the Harvard Lampoon as a cartoonist, actually, not as a writer. But the writing maybe was more my cup of tea. Uh, there were some very g g gifted uh, cartoonists over the Lampoon. You wouldn't expect to find too many at Harvard, but actually they were, they were quite good, about three of them. And I saw that maybe there was a ceiling to my cartooning ability, but I didn't sense the same ceiling for the writing because I'd hardly given it a try. By the time I got out of Harvard, I think I was determined or pretty much resolved to becoming a writer if I could. I did write a lot of uh, light verse and even some verse that wasn't too light. I don't think even I knew there was no living in being a poet. Uh, so fiction was the, the game. Uh, the writers I admired, a lot of them had written numerous essays like Robert Benchley, and I did do my share of those things when I was younger, sold a few of them. But uh, I found when I attempted fiction, I took a few writing courses in, uh, at Harvard, that, you know, it's like a, a sort of a horse you don't know is there, but if you jump on the back, is, uh, there is something under you that begins to move and gallop. And so it's clearly a wonderful imaginary uh, world <laughs> that you enter when you begin to write fiction. So uh, I, guess, I guess my hope was to become a fiction writer. Uh, I was prepared to fail. I was prepared to uh, not be able to get things accepted because I saw that happen to my mother. I knew that not everybody who tried to write actually got published. That in fact, that's kind of a long odds proposition. But uh, I figured if I, I, maybe I'd give myself five years and if I couldn't get into print in five years, I should know that I didn't have what it took. But in, as it turned out, I got into print pretty readily. I actually uh, sold a, a few poems in my teens to marginal magazines. Uh, I remember one poem of the boy who makes the blackboard squeak, meaning the sort of naughty boy who makes the chalk squeak deliberately. But I was paid maybe five or ten dollars for it. But my hope was to get into the New Yorker magazine, which began to come into the house when I was about 11 or 12. The New Yorker was not a Berks County thing. Uh, there may have been a few subscribers, but the newsstands did not carry it because I used to look for it. But my aunt, who lived in Greenwich, Connecticut, and was kind of a hip, hip lady, she was my father's sister. Uh, she thought that we, as a benighted provincial household, could use the New Yorker, and I, in fact, did use it. I loved it, read it, uh, the cartoons, but then other things, too. The whole tone of the magazine was so superior to any other uh, slick magazine. So I, I was aimed at the New Yorker, and uh, my writing career really begins with the day in June of 54 when... When uh, word came up, we were staying with my wife's parents in Vermont, word came up that there was a letter from the New Yorker and they'd taken a poem. And then a little later that summer, they took a story. So I felt, rightly or wrongly, kind of launched as a, as a writer, a real writer. I was in Oxford uh, the year after college uh, with my uh, then wife, who had been a Radcliffe girl. And uh, she was, at that point, a pregnant Radcliffe girl. And so I had a, a little girl in April. And about that same time, uh, Catherine White, who was the fiction editor and a woman of great power, one of the founding members, really, of The New Yorker in 25, and her more famous husband, E.B. White, came to visit us in our basement flat and, indeed, uh, offered me a job. Or maybe she just told me I should see Sean Sean, the editor, oh, when I got back to the States. And I did, and he offered me a job, and I worked in New York for about two years. 
that uh, semester, I think I placed uh, four or five more stories with them, as well as a, quite a number of light verse poems. Light verse was in its twilight, but I didn't know that, so I kept scribbling this stuff, and they kept running it for a while. So I was, I was kind of establishing myself as a dependable contributor. And they were a paternalistic organization that tried to gather unto, it, it's, unto itself um, talented, whatever, writers. And the only, it was funny to want to do that because really uh, about the only slot they had to offer was to write for Talk of the Town, the front section. Uh, and we, we moved in, a little family of three, into Riverside Drive. Uh, and uh, I began to write these stories and discovered I could do it and had kind of a good time doing it. She went around to New York and interviewed people or attended a Coliseum show of kitchen appliances or whatever. And I was very good at making something out of almost nothing. Uh, but I thought after two years that uh, maybe I'd gone as far as I could with the uh, talk of the town as an art form. And uh, I felt New York was kind of in a natural place to live. I had two children at this point. Uh, my wife didn't have too many friends and wasn't, I didn't think, very happy. Although in the 50s, one didn't think too hard about whether or not your wife was happy, uh, sad to say. Uh, but <laughs> even I could see that. So I said, why don't we quit the job for a while? I thought they'd take me back if it didn't work out, and I'll try to freelance up in New England. So there, there's where we went. Moved to a small town in New England, and I never had to go back because I was able to support myself. The technology then was the U.S. mail, so everything took a day or two longer, but really it wasn't all that bad, and it was enough. It was good enough, and uh, also you could get from, from north of Boston to New York in, in a few hours on the train. So I did used to go back and write a couple talk stories. It wasn't a clean break, uh, but it was a break and a kind of a, a daring thing. But I felt that I would be better off in what I thought of as real America, that is, uh, in New York, everything is stratified. The people I knew were other writers. And although it's not a major industry, it was enough of a local industry that everybody was watching everybody else. And I felt like I was being crowded in a way. Small town, you have good odds of being the only writer and people not really taking an interest in what you do. So you are on your own as a person. Uh, and that's how it worked out. I thought it was successful. And also the children were able to uh, not to, to move out of that pressure cooker and they went to the public schools and there were many amenities. I've not ventured too far from what I could verify with my own uh, uh, eyes, although uh, I've tried, of course, in keeping up product uh, to stretch and uh, produce, get a little out of the American middle class. Um, I've written books about Brazil and a novel, a novel located in Africa, in fact. And uh, But yes, basically it's true that my own uh, life has been my chief window for life in America, beginning with my childhood and the, the conflicts, the struggles, uh, the strains that I felt in my own family. It is odd. I loved mystery novels, and uh, I've tried to write them. I, when I was in my teens, I began to write a mystery novel and tried to figure out how to plot it. You sort of plot it backwards, you know. You here's who did it, then you try to hide that. And uh, I, I couldn't really do it. Uh, I'm not saying I couldn't do it if it was a put, gun was put to my head, but it felt unnatural and felt like a very minor kind of witnessing. In other words, I was willing to be entertained by others, but I didn't want to write entertainments myself. I wanted to write books that were as, that told everything I knew, uh, that were as fully about uh, life in my tame uh, band of it uh, as could be said. So yeah, quite early I began to try to become a serious writer. And as you say, it's a little puzzling. I have written some science fiction though, that may not be well known, but a couple of my novels are located in a hypothetical future. And there is something about that that's it frees you up a way. Your, your attempt is always to, yes, write about the world you know, but also to somehow get out of it, if only by a little jump or a trick or something must be different so that your imagination is really engaged. You're not just spilling your life, but that you're to some extent inventing another life. 
in a democracy and in the 20th and now the 21st century, if if you can't base your fiction upon ordinary people and the conflicts which uh, or the struggles, the whatever, the issues that engage ordinary people, then you're reduced to writing about spectacular, unreal people, you know, James Bond or um, some fabulously rich that, uh, that some female writers write about, and you, you cook up adventures. And the trick about fiction, as I see it, is to make an unadventurous circumstance seem adventurous, to make it excite the reader, either with its truth or with the fact that there's always a little more than goes on. I mean, there's multiple levels of reality. As we walk through even a boring day, we see an awful lot and feel an awful lot, and to try to say some of that seems more worthy than cooking up, cooking up thrillers. D.H. Lawrence talks about the uh, purpose of a novel being to extend the reader's sympathy. And it is true that uh, upper middle class women can read happily about uh, thugs, about coal miners, about low life. Uh, and to some extent, they become better people for it because they are entering into these lives that they have never lived and wouldn't want to leave. But nevertheless, uh, it, is, uh, it is, I think, this sense of the possibilities within life, the, the range of ways to live that in part uh, explains the novel's value. I mean, in this day and age, so late really in the life of the genre, why do some of us keep writing them and some of us keep reading them? And I think it is in part because of that, that it makes you more human. It's like meeting people, uh, you know, at a cocktail party that you had never met and wouldn't have cared to meet. You wouldn't have gone out of your way to meet, but suddenly they become real, real to you. You understand to some extent. There is a certain amount of, of, of being honest and really trying to be honest about what it's like to be um, an American male of your age and with your general uh, outlook. So yes, it is, it is a, a path of self-understanding. Uh, but my, the, the fiction that uh, I'm proudest of, insofar as one can discriminate, uh, is that where I have made some leap. I'm best known and been most rewarded, really, prize-wise, uh, praise-wise, uh, for the Rabbit books. And Rabbit is, he and I share roughly the same age and the same, we're born in the same place, but I've left, long left Berks County. He stayed there. And uh, it's a kind of me that I'm not. I never was a basketball star. I wasn't handsome the way he is, and nor was I. Did I have to undergo the temptations of being an early success that way? So that for me, it was a bit of a stretch. Not an immense stretch to imagine what it's like to be a rabbit, but enough of one that it was entertaining for me to write about him, and maybe some of that self-entertainment got into the book. In other words, you can kind of walk around. I can kind of walk around rabbit. Uh, in a way, it's hard to walk around, say, the autobiographical hero of some of your short stories, where, where the, the, it's, you're a twin, you know, and you're attached. And it's the idea of breaking that attachment, I think, that matters, and, that, and where, where the fiction really begins to take off when you can get somebody else in your sights. Yeah, I didn't write that with any idea of a sequel. Uh, but the book does kind of end on a, a hovering note, and people asked me, well, what happened? And enough asked me, not too many, but a few put a bee in my bonnet, that when I had run out of subjects, I thought, well, now why not tell what happened and bring Rabbit back? This was during the late 60s when there was a lot of turmoil in, the, in America, and uh, so I brought him back as this time as kind of an everyman who was witnessing the the pageant of protest and disturbance, distress, drug use, uh, everything, almost, almost everything was in that book, including the moonshot. In fact, the moonshot's kind of a central event in it, uh, so that the rabbit who came back the second time was a much more um, uh, purposefully representative American than, than my initial rabbit. He was just an, uh, you know, a high school athlete who had nowhere much to go after 
after he graduated, whereas the second rabbit is kind of a, a growing man, trying to learn in a way. And I've seen rabbit, and indeed Americans as general, as, as learners, as, as willing to learn. They may be slow to learn, and maybe, but there is an openness to our mindset that I think enables us to overcome our mistakes or our prejudices and move forward. Certainly the the world now is so much more open. I mean, it's easy to be sentimental about the 30s and 40s and the wartime solidarity and all that, but there was so much racism, sexism, oh, everything. It was, the brutal, it was a brutal world compared to the one we're trying to make now. I found that it's the present tense which I began to write Rabbit uh, Run in was a great liberator somehow. I, I loved writing in the present tense, and it's become a bit of a cliche now among younger writers, but at the time it was a bit of a novelty, and certainly a novelty to me, and there's a kind of a level of speed you can get going without the past tense that uh, was suitable to Rabbit and also suitable to me as a writer because the books wrote themselves fairly easily. I say that now, I'm not sure it was always easy, but basically, uh, the present tense plus the combination that this was a landscape that was in my bones, this uh, rural Pennsylvania, semi-rural, metropolitan actually, uh, but anyway, I, I always felt at home writing about him and didn't have much trouble having having things for him to do <laughs> and for the other characters to interact. So, so I was happy to return the, the first time and then having returned for Rabbit Redux, it was it seemed obligatory on my part to write at least two more. More than t more than four, I thought would be milking it uh, unduly, that uh, people are mortal. That's one of the things about them that a fiction writer should be aware of. And so uh, I thought even though he was relatively young that I should kill him off. Well, I was still writing well. Suppose I get sick and then you're left all uh, without a rabbit wrapped up. Rabbit wrapped up, not the bad title. Um, so, <laughs> so at any rate, I did that, and then, and then since I was alive, it turned out uh, ten years later, I wrote, I wrote the sort of novella about the two children finding each other and remembering, sort of their father, and, and him kind of haunting the book. I wanted him to be there as a ghost, kind of felt as a ghost. It was hard for me, also because he'd been so good to me. I mean, the books won prizes, and and as I say, they were fairly easy to write. And uh, but so it was a, a step. But at the time I wrote Rabbit at Rest, I, I thought the time had come to put put him to rest. That uh, it's not as if I was a writer who could only write about this guy. I'd had a good good long run of it, and time to time to let go. In a way, it was a. It was almost corny to take him back to another street game because you'd first see him in Rabbit Run and joining some kids around the telephone pole playing basketball. But, uh, you know, that said, it felt good to me, that whole thing. I went down to Florida, did some research, walked around Fort Myers, tried to get a feel for a Florida city. And uh, it was fun to, fun to do the research and fun to try to, to, try to write, write those scenes. You get, you know, you do get very wrapped up in these uh, characters and uh, care about them. You don't want to get sentimental about them, but yes, yes. And the, and the doctor he sees who tells him he must find something to do, something to do. The rabbit's trouble is that he hasn't really had enough to do since he stopped playing basketball. His wonderful companion in these books was Janice, his wife, and Nelson, his son, and they were the the principles in the first novel, and uh, you have the pleasure not only of seeing Rabbit age, but of trying to turn Nelson from an infant into a man, and a man with a grudge, and yet a man with uh, certain qualities, but, a, but a, a, a destructive capability that Harry uh, can't match in the end, because Harry was destructive when young, but he's become kind of a sweet old geezer uh, toward the end. Well, he feels old to himself, and of course he is overweight, and he is kind of among the retirees down there. And if you'll remember, he's banished for some more sexual misbehavior, so he's kind of alone. And uh, 
Yeah, it doesn't feel too wanted in the world. My mother's parents had the house, and my father had the earning ability, such as it was, so they combined forces about the time I was born in 32. It was the Depression, and my grandfather had been a man of some means. He had retired from farming, bought some securities, and then the securities let him down. And uh, So I was born into a fairly dire situation, and I think one of the reasons that I never had any siblings was that it was economically pinched and my father didn't feel entitled to invite any more people into the world. But for the one that did get through, me, it was kind of bliss, actually. I had all this adult attention and whatever adult en energy was there was focused on me and my, my grandparents were quite, they were old country folk, uh, would speak P Pennsylvania Dutch between themselves, and my, although my grandfather spoke a rather elegant English, uh, but uh, yeah, they they uh, they moderated the effect of my parents. So instead of an edible triangle, I had a kind of pentagon, and which is in a way better. So it was nice. My mother, my mother uh, had a degree. She was unusual in that generation in that she had a master's degree. Had got one at Cornell, and uh, was uh, hoping to become a writer or something artistic. But instead, she. Uh, took a job selling drapes in the local department store and then she uh, she did that for a couple of years. I remember the department store with your mother behind the drapes counter is kind of a romantic place. I mean, there's all these goods and the smells of a department store for a child and escalators, which were a novelty then. Uh, but she then, uh, when my father got a job teaching, she became a housewife and uh, stayed, a, stayed a housewife. It was nice. It was, uh, I can't complain. Uh, it was a fairly uh, crowded neighborhood, so there were lots of other children, m mostly girls, as it turned out, so that I really only had one boy, uh, a playmate. But the town itself was small and compact, the kind of town you can ride from one end to the other on a bike without too much danger or pumping. At Shillington, Shillington, Pennsylvania, that's the place in which it was, a, it was a suburb of Reading, which is the metropolis, and kind of a beautiful city, actually, Reading. A lot of people have not been there, and I don't urge you to go, but it's, a, it's kind of wonderful. It has a pagoda on a mountain. It's uh, Mount Penn, and there's a pagoda built by some eccentric playboy in the 20s, and so <coughs> it, has its, it has its scenic delights, and I always loved Reading, and when I came to write Rabbit Run, I had the... Uh, quiet joy of trying to imagine what it would be like to be in Reading. Uh, so, so yeah, th this was my horizon. Reading and Shillington first, Reading on halfway to the horizon and on the extreme horizon, Philadelphia, where we went maybe two or three times a year. I think any move annoys a child a great deal. All a child asks is that the world holds still while and he or she grows up, and um, many of us don't get that wish. Uh, I was happy in Shillington, and uh, I was a school teacher's son. I had a slight presence. I wasn't especially pop, pop, popular or, or athletic or anything, but I was uh, uh, smart, smart, as they used to say. And uh, so I was, it was fine in Shillington. And I kind of knew the ropes, but my mother wanted to get back to the soil and back to her own roots, which were at this farm. Not, it wasn't the most traumatic thing, like moving to Los Angeles when you're living in the Bronx. That would be traumatic, but no, I continued to go to the same school with my father. I became a commuter. He and I became joint commuters, and in a way I saw a lot more of my father than most boys, American boys, do. So that was good. He and I went back and forth together, had adventures. I'd written about this in a a number of places, but a novel called The Centaur is my main monument to those days with my father, struggling uh, struggling for the dollar and uh, cars that keep breaking down, snowstorms that keep coming under your wheels. But it was beautiful because I saw what it was like to be an American man. I saw that it's a struggle, um, not easy to be an American man. I was an only child, after all, and, and only children uh, tend to read, and uh, my, my mother was a keen reader. Uh, my grandfather was a Bible and newspaper reader, so I saw a lot of reading around me, and uh, 
It's a world a child can control. There were things called big little, little, big little books then, which were essentially bound comic strips, one panel and opposite a page of text, and it was an easy way to read. So I read a lot of those, and then I graduated to mystery novels, some science fiction. I loved Agatha Christie, of course, and also an American team called Ellery Queen. I read a lot of Ellery Queen. Earl Stanley Gardner. I must have read 40 books by Earl Stanley Gardner before I was 15 or so. So I got the reading habit, and that was... And I slightly branched out, you know. I challenged myself. Uh, I remember at the age of 15 going into the library and pulling down The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot and reading it because I'd heard that this was a modern masterpiece. So it was random reading, but maybe that's the best kind in a way. It's not forced on you. Uh, and you get these glimpses now and then of the wonderful world of books. It was a, in Reading, there was a lovely Carnegie endowed library with walls of books. And I remember I read through a, a whole shelf of P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, again, again, my taste was to humor, I think. And uh, it's odd that I didn't become a humorist, really, though. There's some humor, perhaps, in my work. But I began, my first ambition as a writer was to become a humorous writer, to be like Thurber and Benchley and the lighter E.B. White, you know, to make people laugh. I thought that was a harmless thing to do, thing that society <laughs> never could have too much of laughter. Um, anyway, I did a lot of reading. I remember I um, uh, used to lie on this old sofa with a box of raisins, and I would read as many as two books in one afternoon and eat maybe, a, I hope not the whole box, but a fair amount of the box of raisins. So that was my diet for a while. Mm-hmm. As a teacher's son, they were friendly to me, and I had a better understanding of teachers. That they weren't the enemy, as they were for so many children. And uh, I remember one English teacher in the eighth grade, Florence Schrack, whose husband also taught at the high school, was, I thought what she said made sense, and she parsed sentences on the blackboard and gave me, I'd like to think, some sense of English grammar, that there is a grammar, uh, that those commas serve a purpose, and that a sentence has a logic that you can break it down. And uh, I never, I've tried not to forget those lessons um, and uh, to treat the English language with respect as a kind of intricate, Tool. He taught uh, junior high math and first year algebra, and uh, I was I sat in his classes for three years, which is a long time to be a student of your father. But luckily, I was good enough at math, and uh, he was sort of relaxed about having his son in the class. He, he wasn't harder on me or kinder to me than he was to the others, so it was good. Good to see your father at work, too, in a way, isn't it? A lot of kids never know what their father does, can't understand it. It's sort of something mysterious that happens in an office in a skyscraper. I remember, I remember going over a little uh, ritual was I would go over when I was uh, maybe in the sixth or seventh or eighth grade and help him lay out the tablets. First day of school, the Tuesday after Labor Day, the kids would arrive and find the tablets and the pencils and somehow that little sort of ceremony. Uh, uh, I remember it's very precious, but it's never. I never wanted to be a teacher, and I've spent some energy trying to avoid teaching. As a matter of fact, it was hard. I, I Harvard asked me to do the creative writing course one summer, and uh, I did it. And uh, uh, it was uh, there were some good students, and there were some students who didn't show up, and there were some indifferent students. It was fifteen in all. But I found that the effect upon me was not good because these things didn't seem that much worse than stuff I was writing at the same time. I mean, and this effort of this is approaching a piece of fiction as though there's something slightly wrong with it that can be fixed is maybe not the gestalt approach that a real writer ought to have. So this sort of wanting to lift it up to one more level of readability or or interest uh, all that. Some, some men and women can do it. Joyce Carol Oates seems to thrive on teaching, but for me it just made the precariousness of what I was doing all the more evident to me. Now and then it crops up, but uh, maybe because the people I talk to are more kindly now and respectful and so I don't stutter. Stuttering is a kind of, I suppose it shows, it shows basic fright. Uh, 
like in the comic strips, when people begin to stutter, it's because they're afraid. And also a feeling that my father thought that it was, I had too, you know, too many words to get out all at once. So I didn't speak very uh, pleasingly, but I, I, never, uh, I never stopped speaking or trying to communicate this way. And uh, I think the stuttering has gotten better over the years. I found having a microphone is a great help because you don't have to force your voice out of your throat. Just a little noise will will work. Um, but it was it was you know it was real enough. Uh, and uh, one of the th you know you write you write in part because you don't talk very well. And maybe one of the reasons that I was determined to to write was that I didn't uh, I wasn't an orator, unlike my unlike my mother and my grandfather, who both spoke beautifully and spoke all the time. I think maybe I grew up with too many voices around me, as a matter of fact. Since I've gone to some trouble not to teach and not to have any other employment, I have no reason not to go to my desk after breakfast and uh, work there until lunch. So I, I work three, four hours in the morning. And it's not all covering blank paper with beautiful uh, uh, phrases. It's, uh, you begin by answering a letter or two. There's a lot of junk in your life as a writer, and most people have junk in their lives. So, there's, But I try to give about three hours to the project at hand and to move it along. There's a danger if you don't move it along steadily that you'll kind of forget what it's about. So you must keep in touch with it, I figure. So once embarked, yes, I do try to stick to a, a schedule. I've been maintaining this schedule often, well, really, since I, since I moved up to Ipswich in 57. It's a long time to be doing one thing. Yeah, I don't know how to retire. I don't know how to get off the horse, though. Uh, I still like to do it. I still love books coming out. I love the smell of glue and the shiny look of the jacket and uh, the type. And to see your own scribbles turned into more or less impeccable type is still a great thrill for me, so I will probably persevere a little longer, but uh, I do think maybe the time has come for me to be a little less compulsive, maybe abandon the book a year um, technique, which has been basically the way I've operated. This pre present novel that this will be out, The Villages, uh, I several times thought it might be a bad idea and kind of abandoned it. Uh, so it was really the habit, the habit of writing that kept me at it. In the end, it was like a bad marriage. I mean, whatever, this is the wife I'm married to here, and I'm going to going to finish this book. Finishing it becomes the only way to get rid of it. So, yes, it's good to have a certain doggedness to your technique. Um, in college, I was struck by the fact that Bernard Shaw, who became a playwright only after writing five novels, uh, would sit in the British Museum, the, the reading room, and uh, his quota was something like maybe five pages a day, but when he got to the last word on the last page, whether it was the middle of a sentence, he would stop. And so this notion that when you have a quota, whether it's two pages or three is how I think of it, three pages, that it's a fairly modest quota, but nevertheless, if you do it, really do it, the stuff will accumulate. It brought back to me uh, the life I was living at the time and the various real people who lurk behind some of the characters. So it was a, uh, it was a trip down memory lane for me. Uh, the only uh, novelty really in the book was that I rearranged them thematically so that a kind of uh, smuggled autobiography flows beneath the full run of the stories. Uh, I suppose a stronger writer or a more self-critical one might have made a selection, but I thought somehow the value of the book might be in doing them all, doing all the ones that were good enough to get into print. Most of them in the New Yorker, a few of the New Yorker turned down, but I thought this standard was enough that for a writer to become terribly judgmental about his work. Some of the uh, stories could stand a little improvement, which I was happy to bestow. And so for me, it was an exercise in re rewriting to some extent. Uh, I'm glad I did it. I uh, came out to, it's sort of one of the books that's kind of a little too heavy to read with comfort, and I'm sorry about that. I, I, you know, it's a heavy book, heavy book, but uh, there's some kind of statement. There's, it's some kind of a new 
uh, focus is being applied to these old stories just from the way they're arranged. I've re rewritten the early books to some extent. Uh, uh, Rabbit Run had some legal troubles. It was considered racy at the time, and so some ex sexually explicit bits were taken out, and they were later restored. So I was happy. I put them back because it suddenly the climate suddenly became, you know, what's the fuss? Uh, and then again, I've, uh, I've looked at them. Uh, I reread the whole bunch when they were put into an every man for volume. So there has been some rewriting. There's a danger of an older man rewriting a younger man, though. You might just throw out the baby with the bathwater somehow. Uh, and I didn't rewrite. I wasn't in. A, I wasn't looking for trouble with the early short stories. But uh, when you're young, I think you're so surprised to find yourself writing at all, that you jump on almost any word that will work. And when you're older, you sort of know there are lots of words, lots of words that you could use, and so you, your writing becomes a little less uh, inspired and a little more plodding and careful. Uh, but I did marvel at some of the phrases that the younger Updike tossed off. I mean, I thought, this is, I couldn't do this now, I said to myself, so I'm glad I did it when I, when I could do it. I was bringing a... Uh, a kind of verbal, verbal care, a verbal elegance, even that they wouldn't otherwise get. So, in a way, I felt I felt I had a franchise to to maintain, and uh, maybe the writing is too self cherishing in spots. But uh, you know the saying that you should write invisibly; that writing should be invisible. I, I think people know they're reading a book, and that this object in front of them is a page of words. So, I've always felt no. No, what I really like in a book is the sense that the, that the writing is itself uh, entertaining uh, or uh, interesting or you, makes you want to read a sentence twice, that kind of thing I like in other authors and tend to do it myself. I think I try harder to visualize the physical setting, the room, the dress, the, the face, not sure I always succeed. Uh, and there's a way in which you can suffocate an image under words by putting too many, you know. You can handle, say, a pale young lady uh, uh, with arched eyebrows, but once you start going into the eyebrows hair by hair and do the earrings on top of it, you get sort of no image, you get no image. So you have to watch this tendency to over-specify, but I think it is good to Conrad spoke about helping the reader, making the reader see, see, he italicized the word, and I think there is that in my writing, a belief that seeing is, seeing is not quite all, but seeing is a lot of it. And so I, I hope to see it in my own mind and then to transfer it to the reader's mind as best I can. But, you know, readers are different. They have all have different experiences. Bed, the word bed means one thing to you, another thing to me, so in a way you were never read exactly the way that you you would have read yourself. But nevertheless, we're all in the same rough human ballpark here, and I think communication can occur. I didn't set out to become a reviewer much, but I, did, I was a New Yorker writer and looking for any way in which I could appear in the magazine and, and sell and... Uh, I began to drift into reviewing in, in 1960, not very many at first, they had other reviewers, but as they died off, I became for a while the, almost the main reviewer. I did more reviews than anybody else, and uh, you could say I was doing too many. I did try to avoid American contemporaries, many of whom, as you say, I knew, uh, because who knows where envy or friendship enter in and distort the honesty of the book, book report. Uh, so I tried to review foreign or dead or Latin American, European or Latin American writers. There was a lot of ferment then, uh, magic realism. Uh, uh, the novel in Europe was much more overtly experimental than I'm aware of its being now. So I thought there were things I could learn just as a reader from reading these books. So I tried to read books that would further my own education, as well as earn me the money of the book review and uh, keep me up. It's very easy to... When you've written for those three or four hours, your appetite for words is rather diminished, so it's all too easy to go to not read much. So the reviews did keep me reading and uh, acquainted with, the, you know, trends, trends in 
what do we do with this old old uh, dinosaur of the novel? You know, what 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 new can we? Because the novel is in a very capacious plastic. It's sort of what you make it, and it's taken many forms. Uh, Ulysses is. You know, you can't repeat that, but that is an example of a novel that really tried to do, you know, there's, uh, do everything. So uh, we are, we postmoderns are faced with this notion that maybe we're not taking it far enough. We're accepting the old conventions, quote marks, and he said, she said, and when we had these experimental writers who've done so much. So anyway, it's good to good in a way to make yourself think about these basic issues. Why are you doing this at all? What are you bringing to it that's different? Are you just feeding the machine or are you in some way altering the machine? All these things are probably up to a point useful. But in the end, you're left with your own intuitions and your own sense of whatever, beauty or meaning or urgency. There are a number of contemporary writers whose work I've, I used to try to keep up with faithfully. Uh, Ann Tyler was one when she was younger, before she became a bestseller, but I thought she was really quite a magical writer and a very sweet-natured novelist, you know, no gripes, just trying to show you, again, sort of what uh, I try to do to show ordinary life as having a, you know, being worth writing about. Uh, Philip Roth is, of course, a uh, marvelous writer and a great liberator, in a way, of, of what could be said. I have fallen behind after reviewing and admiring his uh, earlier work a great deal. Um, Muriel Spark is, and Myris Murdoch were English writers that I tried to keep up with. I'm trying to think of what I'm reading now, and all I get is my, some proofs of my own book, but I know there have been some. Uh, I recently reviewed a book called The Master by an Irish writer called uh, Colm Toibin, uh, very interesting in the attempt. It it was, but for me it was. Uh, oh, it was static in a strange way. But anyway, it was an honorable attempt to write a novel that had never been written before. I don't think Henry James has been the hero of too many novels. So that yeah, I, uh, I also there are a lot of classics that I would do well to reread or else to read for the first time. I recently read Vanity Fair after long last. Here I am, 70 odd years old, and I never read Vanity Fair. So that in a way is the most enjoyable when you put yourself to school with a, an old classic. I read a fair amount of Conrad, and there's still some left that I never got around to, but he's a wonderful, uh, amazing, Amazing that he did all this in his second language, or maybe his third language even. Uh, but uh, he had the the ability to to make the novel seem serious. At the same time, he had this backlog of exotic ports and sh uh, sailing, uh, being a shipmaster. So he had a lot of uh, middle brow experience plus this high brow approach to to what writing was all about that makes for a very tonic, tonic kind of fiction, I think. You hesitate to give advice to young writers because uh, y there's a limit to what you can say. It's not exactly like being a musician or even an artist where there's a, a set number of skills that, that have to be mastered. I, I, I marvel at musicians, by the way, that people can play the piano and the violin with that speed and that accuracy. Obviously, they need a lot of training. I'm not sure writers, sometimes writers need uh, no training, and some of the amateur ones who just jump in do better than the ones who have the, the PhD in creative writing. Uh, colleges are very willing now to teach you, to sub give you a whole course of creative writing courses, uh, although I took some when I was a student. I'm a little skeptical about the, the value. I think what uh, maybe young writers have lost is the sense of writing as a trade. When I was young, it was still a trade. There was enough magazines, middle brown magazines, general interest so-called magazines. They ran fiction, but also articles. And you felt that there was a some appetite out there for this sort of fiction, stories. Uh, now, now, I don't think that the university, the academic publications, although they run fiction, have quite replaced this sense. Uh, fiction is in danger of becoming a kind of poetry. 
that only other poets read it, only other fiction writers care about it, and uh, any way that you can break through. So I don't sneer at writers like Stephen King who have managed to capture the interest of a large audience. I figure if you don't have any audience, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, Tom Wolfe, the younger, Tom Wolfe, the journalist, of course, has spouted off very eloquently about the failure of American writers to galvanize a readership the way he thinks Zola and Dreiser and some others uh, did. Um, I think you can force this. I mean, we can't do Zola now, uh, exactly. Somehow it just doesn't sing. So you're sort of stuck with being a whatever, postmodern. Um, to the young writers, I would merely say, try to develop actual work habits, and even though you have a busy life, try to reserve an hour, say, or more a day to, to write. Some very good things have been written on an hour a day. Henry Green, one of my pets, uh, was an industrialist, actually. He was running a company, and he would come home and write for just an hour in an armchair, and the wonderful books were created in this way. So take it seriously, uh, set a quota, Try to think of communicating with uh, some ideal reader somewhere. Try to think of print, of getting into print. Don't be content just to call yourself a writer and then bitch about the crass publishing world that won't run your stuff. Uh, we, we all are, yes, this is, we're still a capitalist country and writing to some degree is a capitalist enterprise when it's not, not a total sin to try to make a living and court an audience. Um, Read what excites you would be advice, and even if you don't imitate it, uh, you will learn from it. All those mystery novels I read, I think, did give me some lesson about keeping a plot taut, uh, trying trying to move forward or make make the writer make the reader feel a kind of a tension is being achieved, a string is being pulled tight, and um, other than that. Uh, don't try to get rich, on the other hand. I don't think it's, it's uh, if you want to get rich, you should go into uh, investment banking or um, being a certain kind of lawyer. But on the other hand, uh, I would like to think that in a country this large and a language even larger, that there ought to be a living in it for somebody who, who uh, cares and wants to entertain and instruct uh, a reader. I certainly uh, bought into the American dream of that was uh, voiced by the propagandists of World War II, and I was a great moviegoer, and the movies in the 30s and 40s were where you could see preachments about the American dream, and so I still believe in the uh, American dream. I see it in terms of... of uh, freedom and a government that trusts its people to exercise freedom. Uh, that this is not a government that, uh, a government that allows you to give, uh, that allows you to uh, explore and, and uh, doesn't uh, dampen your own creativity in the broadest sense with a lot of dictums or dogmas or uh, restraints. So insofar as we can remain a a free country that allows for the interplay of personal energies. Uh, I think this is still a, a country that is not only working toward a dream, but actually is the dream in action. Uh, for all of the knocks that we take in the foreign press, and we've taken a lot lately, I think this is still a country where people want to come. And they want to come, I think, because they feel they are. A, a, French, a French friend of my, one of my stepsons, a uh, boy about 16, just said uh, about the way people dress in America, he said, they are not afraid. And I thought this is a great insight, you know, in France, are the people, well, the French are in a way afraid not to dress in the appropriate costume <laughs> of a snappy housewife or whatever, and there is a kind of, of sense of the way, the proper way to dress. And in America, yeah, he censors. So that was his way of saying that, yeah, it's a it's country that without a government uh, we need be afraid of. It's, uh, it's been, the country's the land has uh, been good to me. I, I realize uh, I was lucky uh, and be born at a lucky time too. So I hesitate to prescribe for today's children, but I would hope they would grow up with something of the same sense of that it's a 
privilege to be an American. It was funny. Uh, it, I think Random House was the publisher, and they they didn't they weren't sure how I'd react, and so I was shown a, a manuscript, a photocopy of the manuscript, fairly late in the game. But how could I not be pleased by it? As you say, it's the homage of a younger writer, and what's charming about it is, is Baker, with his gift for precision, admits he hasn't read an awful lot of me. He's a long list of books of me he has not read, and some of the things that he chose to take us inspirational, in fact, were either not there at all or were not there in quite the way he remembered them. So it was a very good image of how we use other writers. We take what we want, we take what we need, and I'm happy to have been of some use to, to Nicholson Baker, uh, really, and you know, I was very moved and amused by it, because it's funny. And he's a, he's a writer who, one of the, you asked me who I like to read. Well, I do read everything that Nicholson Baker writes, because uh, not only because he flattered me in this way, but because I think he's a very interesting sens sensibility who really is trying to uh, tackle the whole um, uh, fiction ball from a different angle. I've never seen anybody who writes quite like him or admits to these obsessions. Talk about the daily and the Picayune, small things. His last book, a Book of Matches, uh, or Box of Matches, was very much it was sort of hyper updike in the, the, the tales of it. I, and in, in a word, I was, I was, ple I was uh, pleased and amused uh, by the book. Grateful for it.